Um, so, and we are live with Kyle. How are you, Kyle? I'm well. How are you doing, Sonny? I'm I'm holding in there. I'm not gonna lie. It's, uh, <laughs> it's actually we had a beautiful weekend here in, in Toronto. It was like plus twenty, which is a bit rare considering it's November. <laughs> Yeah, it's about to be 80 here in Virginia today, I think. So got a little heat wave rolling through. Yeah, cool. Okay, so I'm trying to remember. I like to start with, uh, I guess, where we maybe met or connected. And it's usually always a question mark for me because I, I, I always forget. But I, I know, I, I think, I feel like it might have been at one of the New York um, conferences, right? Where I think we met maybe physically for the first time, but I think we maybe exchanged uh, messages prior to that. Is that correct? Probably like an Inside Bitcoins New York, one of those mm. one year, I think, because I used to go, like I was saying before we went live, uh, I used to be their editor in chief. Mm. If some of the like the early guys remember the Inside Bitcoins conferences, it was like a, a conference circuit that ran for maybe three or four years. Uh, and they had events in New York, San Diego, uh, Seoul, Korea. Um, and other places around the world. But I, I think we mostly just chatted via Twitter um, after that. Maybe, maybe we, I don't even remember if we met in the, the uh, New York conference, but. Yeah, yeah, I think we maybe just brushed, uh, brushed shoulders, but, uh, but no, I think, I think this is probably one of our first times actually having a real conversation. So appreciate you, uh, you know, spending some time with me and, and getting into it. So, uh, so my first question um, is, is really around you know, what's your story, not just like the 30 second, what's your kind of Bitcoin story, if you will, but more like the backstory, you know, kind of what your lens was looking into this Bitcoin space coming into it before, right? So like kind of, why was it like, what was it about, you know, this space that captured your interest and, and kind of that and then dovetailing into, you know, the past this Bitcoin singularity and, and what kind of, you know, what your life looked like after that, but would love to dive into that, Kyle. Yeah. So I think in terms of like my path of what brought me to Bitcoin, it starts probably around the 2008 election, I would think. Mm. I was I had just like dropped out of college because I was going to uh, college and I didn't really know why, which I think a lot of people my age around that time were doing that. They're just like, well, this is the next step after high school, I guess. And then you take on all this debt and you're taking these classes that aren't really teaching you much and you're paying all this money. And so I, I dropped out of school and I basically just like, what have I started figuring out like on my own? What am I going to do with my life? Like, what am I, what career path am I going to go down? Um, and I got really into, you know, I was thinking about building my own website. I was thinking about, um, you know, getting into, I was actually thinking about becoming an accountant at that time too. So I was, trying, I was really like when Bitcoin came along, I was really trying to think about, you know, what, what is my career path going to be? Um, and then so Bitcoin was 2008 was the white paper and then launched in 2009. So around that time when I was still trying to figure out what I want to do, I got into search engine optimization. Um, and I started doing that basically freelance work, just like keyword research, writing, you know, content for local businesses, just for their websites. So that's, the, that's what I was doing before I started doing the Bitcoin stuff. And the reason I got interested in the Bitcoin is because 2008 was also Ron Paul's uh, presidential run, which is like a common story in the Bitcoin space when they get interested in like economics, uh, you know, monetary policy, that kind of stuff, and the Fed, all that kind of stuff. And this was this is around the same time that Satoshi is releasing the white paper for the first time on the crypto cryptography mailing list. So, you know, just like I was trying to figure out, you know, what kind of career path do I want to go down? I was also able to vote for the first time. So I, you know, started to look closer into, you know, politics and that kind of stuff for the first time in my life as well. And, you know, I just watched the debates and I'd see this Ron Paul guy seeming like he was, you know, he was talking in plain English. He was saying things that made sense. So I became more interested in what he was doing. That led me to his financial advisor or his economic policy advisor, Peter Schiff. So I started checking out his stuff. I started looking into, you know, the Austrian School of Economics, read, you know, Thomas Wood's Meltdown book, uh, you know, what has government done to our money? Like all that kind of stuff. And so I was kind of like 
uh, it turned into like basically a, a gold bug because Bitcoin didn't exist yet. Or if it did exist, like I didn't know about it because, you know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, in the news or anything yet. Um, and on the other side, I still I also had this interest in, you know, technology. Uh, my entire life, like I was always on my laptop, you know, usually when I was younger, I was just playing, you know, Counter-Strike or whatever. But <laughs> um, as I got older, I got interested in like uh, coding and, you know, how how a lot of the basic infrastructure of the Internet works. And I think what it all came together was the, see, this is the thing. I can't remember if it was, it was around the same time. It was uh, Joe Rogan's producer guy, Red Band, on his podcast, mentioned Bitcoin, like, offhand in one of the episodes. Um, what, year, what year are we in now? 2000 when? This is, this is 2011, I think. 2011, yeah. okay, okay. And you're living in Virginia or here yeah. elsewhere? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, uh, I found I found out about Bitcoin either from Joe Rogan's podcast or the Gawker article, which is like a common one that people remember seeing when it came out, which is basically about the Silk Road. Um, and, you know, all these people are buying drugs on the Internet and getting away with it. And there's this thing called Tor where you can use the Internet anonymously. Um, they're, they're, using this, they're using this new payment system, it seemed it was to me at the time, because I knew nothing about Bitcoin. So I was like, oh, this is some kind of anonymous payment system or something. Like That's how little I knew about Bitcoin. That's how little everyone really uh, knows about it when they first find out about it. They're like, it's some kind of nerd money. Or So I, I started looking at that just because I was like, how are these people buying drugs on the internet? And like, how is this even possible? You know, like I, I always thought of the internet as something that was like completely controlled. You know, you do your commerce on eBay um you know there's not very, very much anonymity so I, I basically got interested basically out of my curiosity for how the silk road worked and then i started to learn more about bitcoin's monetary uh how it works from a monetary perspective over time and it, it as everyone says it just kind of snowballed and i went down the rabbit hole and i never came out of it <laughs> <laughs> uh wow that that's pretty fascinating yeah i know i was gonna say um the the ron paul piece so uh, just curious because that that was very similar to to myself and, and like you said many others how did you how did you stumble upon ron paul i think it was probably youtube and like i said i was just like getting interested in politics i started watching the debates and stuff and mm. I, I think I, there's a few moments that he had in the debates. I remember he called out Rudy Giuliani saying, like, the reason that they're attacking us here is because we're over there. Um, and he, he, I remember he gave, he had like a press conference where he gave Rudy Giuliani like a reading list or something. It was like, uh, uh, it was, he was just basically, it was like a political move, but it was, it was kind of hilarious. And then, so yeah, it was basically the debates and then, going on the internet. And I remember I would go on like Daily Paul every day. Like if you remember that website, it was just like a oh, 100%. blog or something. <laughs> it was like a blog. Yeah, yeah. I actually got to see Dr. Ron Paul in person at one of his rallies or speeches or whatever. And my, my parents lived in, in Houston for almost 10 years. And so, so yeah, my wife and I, we drove up to, um, to Austin and it was, it was just like one of the coolest things ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I'm big he, fan. And, 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 I was gonna say sorry, Kyle, but I tried to interrupt you. I was gonna say I, I eventually I ended up even getting to meet Dr. Ron Paul at uh, at one of the Satoshi Roundtables. Bruce actually. Oh yeah, I saw he's uh, he's been at a, like a few, maybe two or three like Bitcoin events. I've seen it, but yeah, I remember Bruce invited him to because uh, I saw some pictures from it. Yeah, so he's the the man, the you know the the legend himself. Uh, but yeah, sorry, you were gonna say something. Yeah. Uh. I don't know. I don't. Oh, I don't maybe not. <laughs> and then the, other thing, the, other, the other thing I was going to ask you about was Peter Schiff, right? That's also another interesting kind of thing, right? Because, yeah. because like yourself, it sounds like you and I probably uh, went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole far before Dr. Ron Paul did. But more recently, he's, you know, he seems like he's very uh, excited about the future of Bitcoin and speaks very positively about it. But then like Peter Schiff kind of fell behind on that one. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Ron Paul is just he's for he follows Hayek's thought of competing currencies. So he's just like Bitcoin is just another option if people want to use it. I don't know if he's like come out and endorsed it or anything. I think mm. he, he probably still prefers gold. But I, honestly, I also don't like follow 
Ron Paul as closely as I, yeah. you know, was when I was got excited by his philosophy when I first found out about, about him. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, I mean, Schiff is, you'd think he would be like the, the kind of guy that would fall in love with Bitcoin like right away. I mean, we've seen like his son, I don't know if you've seen his son tweeting about Bitcoin a lot. Of course, um, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. But he, he, he still seems resident to do it. And the, the real question that I always want to ask him, and I kind of have in roundabout ways because I've like written articles about, um, you know, when he went on Joe Rogan, I wrote an article about all the things that he got wrong uh, about Bitcoin on during the Joe Rogan podcast. And then he like responded to it kind of like he posted it on Facebook and then said, oh, this is what I think or whatever. But the thing that he's never um, really explained is why when he's a libertarian and he wants to use gold as money if you if you have a digital form of gold it's always going to be easily controllable by the governments and people like you're not going to be able to have censorship resistant transactions with with uh, digital gold currencies like e-gold or liberty reserve um like those got shut down and then gold money it's just like another bank in terms of like you do a bunch of kyc and aml and everything so it's like if he is a true libertarian, I think he should be for Bitcoin because it enables people to have um, privacy in the long run. Obviously, obviously, Bitcoin isn't that private right now, but it, it basically enables private transactions to happen online um, because you need that base decentralized layer that can't be shut down, that's censorship resistant, and then you can build everything else kind of on top of that. What's his main beef? With Bitcoin, do you know? Like, if you had to sum it up into like a sentence or two, do you know? I mean, it still seems like know. a lot of those mm -hmm. uh, those arguments that we used to hear in like the early days, where it's like, oh, it's just a Ponzi scheme, it's just it's tulips. Like, it's still a lot of that kind of stuff. It seems. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. He just never got past that, I guess. Okay, okay. So just to go back to kind of like your storyline, um, I'm also curious to know. I mean, like. Like the way I initially, you know, heard about you, uh, or I, I'm pretty sure I became aware of about you is through your writing, right? Because you, 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 um, you've been writing for. Hey, uh, Kyle, did I lose you? Your your video. Uh, I'm just gonna pause it. Yeah. So the next piece of, uh, I guess, what I was really curious about is is your relationship with writing. That's something that I'm really, really uh, intrigued by. I'm I'm more like an engineer, um, but one of my favorite classes in engineering was our our class uh on like english essentially and learning how to write properly and and all of that and and since then i've you know just kind of picked up a few books here and there but really curious about like how, how did that begin um and it was it just something that spawned out of nowhere one day you just sat there and you're like i'm gonna start writing or is it something that you've been cultivating for for a long time you know it's weird because in school i was always much better at math than writing like I didn't I didn't really like English classes at all I, I would always do well in all my math classes and you know in the SAT I was doing a lot better on, in math than, than writing um, but as I said before I was doing search engine opt optimization stuff so through that mm -hmm. I actually started writing a lot um, it wasn't anything like useful it was mostly like content mill kind of stuff where you just like mm -hmm. you know bullshitting your way through writing about this local you know sewage waste company or something like that so but uh i guess it was like late 2013 you know obviously i'm doing this seo stuff but it, it's basically just to pay the bills i'm not like that interested in it you know i'm still trying to search what what uh you know what motivates me what do i want to do with my life and that's when i start getting more and more interested in bitcoin this is probably 2013 by 2013 i'm like obsessed with bitcoin and it's like all i'm doing all day is like reading bitcoin articles watching you know watching andreas antonopoulos videos you know the same thing everyone else was doing around the same time and so late 2013 i just decided you know i'm just going to go for it and start writing articles and see if I get any traction with them because um, I think the first one I ever wrote was for Let's Talk Bitcoin. But then the second one I wrote was for the Yahoo Contributor Network, which was basically, it's, it doesn't exist anymore, but it was kind of like the Forbes Contributor Network that they have now or, and stuff like that, where basically you can 
once you get approved, you can just like publish on Yahoo and they'll promote it and everything like that. So I did that and I posted my first article on there on Reddit and it got a bunch of upvotes and I guess the Kaiser report report people saw it and they talked about it on their show. And then like a few weeks after that, they had me on the show to talk about, um, I think it was unrelated to the article, but um, so basically it was Reddit that kind of enabled me to go from, you know, like a nobody to someone that was writing these articles that people found interesting, like in a matter of, of weeks. Um, and that first article, I think it was, it was like Bitcoin 2.0, MasterCoin, open transactions, um, like all these different Bitcoin. Cause I was like when the Bitcoin 2.0 meme first started and they were like, oh, this is like Bitcoin, but now you can do this and this and this. And I think it even predated Ethereum or like the Ethereum white paper, yellow paper, whatever it's called, might've just come out like around then. Um, but yeah, that's basically how I got into writing about Bitcoin. Uh, so that's super fascinating. Hey, am I mistaking or is MasterCoin David Johnston or like, was he one of the contributors? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. And yeah. in MasterCoin, I mean, you said Bitcoin 2.0, but I mean, it was kind of the, yeah, the, the first wave of like, how do you turn Bitcoin or something like Bitcoin into a Swiss army knife, if you will, right? Like, how do you, uh, you know, build programs on top of Bitcoin? Uh, well, well, what was your article about? Like, what, what did you say? Was it just about the launch of it? Or like, I don't know, what was kind of the like the final takeaway? I think it was just uh, pointing out that uh, Bitcoin, like the, the technology could be used for things besides just simple currency transfer. I think around that, like uh, my views around like altcoins and stuff are very different than they were back then too like I, at that time i was like trying to figure out are these can these be worth anything like are people just going to use bitcoin i don't see how these app coins are going to have any value from where they called them app coins and not icos back then um mm. uh but yeah it's basically just outlining these different bitcoin 2.0 like systems and um i don't think I, I don't think it really took a take on like whether or not they would succeed or anything it was just like these exist and we'll see you know what happens next interesting, obviously interesting. like and now now uh mastercoin is omni for those who don't know which mm. is like what tether tether was based on for a long time and now they're like moving over to ethereum okay cool uh yeah very very interesting okay so what what comes next what what happened after that um so so you write this article you go from you know uh yeah you go from zero to hero uh everyone in bitcoin knows you loves you you're on max <laughs> kaiser what, what's after that Yeah, so then that's when I, I basically was able to um, have a full-time career just writing about Bitcoin, just from the prominence that came from, you know, those first few articles that got some attention. Attention, I was like, I guess I have some traction here. I, I'm going to run with it, basically. And so I first started writing with the Crypto Coins News. Back in the day, it was like them and Coindesk were the only two sites, I think, that were running for a while, like in 2013, 2014. So I became their like editor in chief and so I was writing and like overlooking other people's articles on there. Um, then see, at this point, it's like hard to remember what my actual uh, path was, but I remember I, I wrote some freelance articles for Vice Motherboard. Um, I had one at Business Insider. So I was doing like freelance stuff on top of the um, editing job at Crypto Coins News too. And then I eventually moved to Inside Bitcoins who ran a bunch of conferences, as, as I was saying, and I was their editor in chief. So I was writing a few articles a day for them and going to their conferences and covering those. Um, and then eventually, I think a lot of people associate my work with uh, Bitcoin Magazine. Like once I started writing for them, I think of people people saw a lot of my work and Aaron Van Wordham's work on there and they started gravitating towards Bitcoin magazine as like a a trusted uh, Bitcoin news outlet. Um, so yeah, I just kept writing for anyone that wanted to take my work over time. And um, now I'm trying to build out my own platform kind of with um, the crypto feed, but that's still like very alpha early stages kind of it's basically just like an experiment i'm working on right now to figure out where it takes me interesting interesting so so uh how long were you with bitcoin magazine for uh i probably wrote for them 
for, let's see, 2014 until, I might have even written a little bit for them earlier this year, I can't remember, but so I guess almost five years, but I was always freelance with them. I think Aaron is, Aaron might be an employee, he's like an editor and stuff there. So, but yeah, I was always uh, freelance with pretty much every everywhere I worked, except for Inside Bitcoins, I was exclusive with them for a little while. And Kyle, so I, I don't know, like how many articles did you write during that time? Like many, I assume, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to, I do have like links to all of my past articles. If you go to my personal website, kyletorpy.com. Mm. Okay. Um, but if you, yeah, I, I would guess like over a thousand. I'm not really what? sure. <laughs> Cause some Are you days serious? I'll, I'll be pumping out like three in a day. Oh my God. Um, but then, then I would also go on like a hiatus for like a month, you know, and not write anything. So it's like, it's hard to, but yeah, I probably wrote around a thousand. That would be my guess off the top of my head. Interesting. Okay. So, so, okay. I'm really curious about, uh, about what you're saying here, because um, like coming at it from more like the other side, if you will, like from like the um, kind of the entrepreneurial side, um, like journalists are either your kind of like your best friend or your worst enemy. And 99% of them, uh, unfortunately, fall into the latter category. And my experience with most of them has been that they're, they've got some story that they're trying to like angle and they're trying to fit you into it. And usually that story has nothing to do with, you know, kind of, I guess, but I'm just curious, like, how do you, how do you find, how do you si separate the signal from the noise, number one, in this space? And then number two, um, how do you, uh, and maybe you being a freelancer is, is part of the, the answer, but like, how do you also separate your bias from, um, you know, the types of work that you're putting out there? Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah. Well, in terms of like the signal to noise ratio, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm trying to work on now with the crypto feed. Um, it started out, it was just a, it was like basically my own personal news feed that I generated just to keep track of the news on my own. And then I just kind of like took that feed and made a Twitter bot for it. So like it would automatically tweet out all these articles that were coming in. Um, but obviously for most people, that's way too noisy. So now what I'm trying to do is like, I personally go through this entire feed where it's like all the crypto news sites, all the mainstream mainstream sites uh, filtered by keywords, all the reddits, all the, every, like everything is just in this single feed for me. And then I go through it and um, I pick out literally the signal from the noise throughout the day and uh, share those articles. And I'm probably, you know, it's, it's devolving sort of into a traditional news site at this point where I'm going to end up, you know, just writing articles for each story that I think is, you know, relevant each day. Um, and then what was the other? And then the second happier? part was, I guess, like, okay, so that, that, that answers that. Um, and then the second part was more around like, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, is, is, is that again, my experience with like at least traditional media or like, you know, reporters or journalists is usually that they're, They've right. already got a predefined narrative. And I'm just curious, like, do, do you define it? Or is it like, is there a process? Or do you work with like kind of your subjects, if you will, to, to figure it out? But like, how does yeah. that work? So throughout this entire time, I never really referred to me, to myself as a journalist. But I know yeah, I, I saw, I saw the air people. quotes. I saw the air quotes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the only time hey Kyle. Hey Kyle. Journalist and it's like, hey Kyle, I'm can dope. you can you rewind like ten seconds? Like, cause right, you you turned into Robocop. Sure. Uh, so like most people, when they call me a journalist, it's usually with those air quotes around that that you saw in my Twitter bio. So it's okay. usually they like. I, I don't call myself a journalist, but other people will do it with the air quotes around it as like an insult, basically. But you know, then other people do call me a journalist with without the air quotes or whatever. So I like to leave it up to other people to uh, define what I do, basically, because um, that's in some ways it's really all that matters at the end of the day. Um, you know, I also people will also call me a troll sometimes when I publish things that they don't want to see published, which is you know, basically the definition of a journalist from, from back in the day. Um, 
so I kind of, if someone calls me a troll, it's like, uh, I guess I'm doing something journalistic here and I should keep going down this, uh, this, this topic here. Um, yeah, in terms of like, what am I, like, what is my role? Um, you know, I think we're, we're seeing obviously like media is completely changing because of the internet. Like you had these gatekeepers that were in control of information and then social media came. Now everyone is just posting whatever they want all the time, um, which has caused a lot of chaos. And we could get into that if you wanted later, but basically like, I, I see the role of journalists kind of changing a lot and we're, we're kind of seeing this play out um, just because if you take Bitcoin as an example, like all the mainstream, for lack of a better term, all the mainstream outlets, the reason they get, they've gotten things so wrong with Bitcoin, like, uh, and obviously with like a, a lot of other things too, but like when we see them get something wrong with Bitcoin, it's more obvious to us because we know a lot about the space and everything, but you have to imagine that they're doing this with everything else too. It's just like, we're not as, you know, knowledgeable about topics that aren't Bitcoin related because this is what we do like every day. Um, so like the, the problem is like they, they take, they have these like journalistic standards and everything, but they know nothing about Bitcoin at all. So it's like you, it's, it's an attack vector for scammers. Basically, if you look at someone if you look at someone like, uh, you know, Craig Wright acting like he's Satoshi and everything, he goes to a traditional journalist and he tells them all this stuff and they research and everything. And they, they put out an article where it's like, this guy is launching a new thing on Bitcoin. And, um, you know, they, they give it like a balanced view where like maybe he's a scammer, maybe he's not. Everyone in Bitcoin knows he's a scammer. <laughs> like, so they're giving it, it's like, so what, I guess to, to answer your question, like what I see myself doing is I've been in, in the Bitcoin space for so long that I'm both um, relaying stories to people and, and giving like context around, you know, uh, you know, the information. So like a new, a new coin can be launched and get press in TechCrunch or something. And it's like this revolutionary, revolutionary new product and really, it's just like a pump and dump scheme. And it's obvious to big, longtime Bitcoiners like, oh, this is just like another altcoin pump and dump. But they're getting press in these mainstream outlets because they just don't have the they don't have like specialists that are covering these topics. Like it's just journalists trying to figure out everything. And that's that's a problem that has been exposed in journalism uh, more broadly, as I said, not not just in the Bitcoin space. Mm. Mm, oh my goodness. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, uh, it's a major problem. Um, I mean, the most, um, I guess like the most, like the biggest example I could think of that, that where things kind of, you know, so let's say the government comes out and says, uh, Bitcoin is not legal tender. Okay. Well, that, that's a fair statement to be made. A, a journalist will take that and be like, well, therefore Bitcoin means it's illegal. And yeah, those two statements I mean, are not not equivalent yet. Um, people will sometimes like take the liberty to do stuff like that. And and what that has is that has like obviously negative consequences on the industry and like, you know, customers and businesses and decision makers and regulators. And so I, I guess I guess maybe the a more positive kind of spin to this question might be like, how, how does the world, um, you know, address this? Because I see also what's going on with like, cause I, and I am interested by the way in going down a little bit down this like rabbit hole. Um, but like I see, for example, now, you know, even like, I guess like the president or former president is even being not censored, but I guess you could say like, there's like these warning signals all over Twitter now, every time I see anything from Trump. Uh, so I just, I just wonder like how, like who decides, who decides what's real and, and what isn't, um, yeah. Or is, or is that what your company's purpose is? <laughs> hey, Kyle, are you there? Oh, all right. I had a little bit of a technical issue, but we are back. Um, okay, so Kyle, I guess my main question was, is that, you know, just to drill a bit deeper into what you were alluding to earlier, um, is, 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 is that, 
you know, who does determine the truth? Like, uh, yeah, like, I mean, you know, we have media, established media. Uh, there's this challenge where they cannot realistically get you know, the, the, like they cannot be, you know, totally knowledgeable about every field all the time. And, um, and so they do have these requirements to push out, you know, articles on a regular basis. And, you know, here we are, right? So, so I guess my question is, is that, you know, aside from like your company and all that, like just generally speaking, do you think that, I mean, it just seems like a really like a quagmire of a, of a challenge. Like how, how does how does the world go about even thinking about this? And 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 I guess eventually figuring out a way to, you know, like a truth meter. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there have been uh, hold on, I'm getting I'm hearing myself now. Oh right. you might want to turn uh maybe the the volume down on the computer or no but then you wouldn't be able to hear me mm. is there a way for me to just mute my phone so All right, back again. Uh, okay, so yeah, so the question was, is like, how do we figure out what the truth is? You know, where, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, like I said, like we're seeing a lot of chaos just from, you know, as I said, we have these gatekeepers controlling information. Now everyone can do information, which is good in some ways and then obviously bad in others. Like I, I see the rise of like, Trump and even someone like Alex Jones, like everyone says it's only, or a lot of people say it's only this horrible information, misinformation coming from the internet. But the reason these alternatives that were even not even good were able to come to prominence is because um, like there was failings uh, of the mainstream sources as well. So like, Someone like CNN would say, you know, Alex Jones is terrible, and I'm not here to defend Alex Jones, but I'm just saying CNN looks at Alex Jones and sees it as misinformation, but they, they haven't really looked at themselves that much yet in terms of, you know, what were their failings that led people to go to these other alternatives that were so terrible, really, in terms of quality of information, and yet they still went to them. Um, like, what... what they haven't really looked at like why why are they doing that in the first place like what what are we doing wrong where people are turning to Alex Jones for news instead of CNN um, but, it, but more generally I think this ties back to what I was saying where like the journalists around Bitcoin don't really know what they're talking about so it's easier to fool them and they just pump out these uh, bad pieces kind of where it's, it's it's not informed I think what we're seeing is like even with social media the experts are becoming the media and the need for the journalists in between is becoming um, less of a requirement, I guess I would say. I mean, you're even seeing this um, with companies now building out their own media platforms. I think Kraken has uh, sort of done this where they're like creating their own content. We're seeing more of that. Um, and obviously like Elon Musk is, has like a new policy at Tesla where they're like, we're not going to talk to the media at all. Like we can just post it on our blog whenever we want to, um, say anything. Um, but yeah, and then that creates another problem where like, you're not getting unbiased information. Like there's, these are just like propaganda pieces for these companies. Um, so I, I mean, I think it's still too early to tell how all this is going to play out like we're we're all trying to figure out how to deal with this large influx of information and trying to figure out like what what's real what's not and that kind of ties into what i'm building with the crypto feeds like basically a, i'm basically like a curator of information around bitcoin online privacy and these other related topics and i think we're going to see more of that come to prominence over time, like you're gonna see the value of being a good curator is be going to become more more obvious over time. And I mean, we're, we're even seeing that with Twitter, like you, there are two ways to look at that where it's like they're either censoring the president or they're curating information and making sure that 
the information that rises to the top is quality information. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I, I view it. I think the the curators are, of information are going to become kind of like just as important as the journalists over time. Hey, and Kyle, uh, just sorry, just but on this topic of so Twitter, right? Twitter has changed the game, right? In that sense, I mean, we talk about blogging. I mean, this is kind of like I guess micro blogging, but you know, even like the president of the United States or Trump, he's always you know tweeting, right? Um, so, so number, I, mean, I guess my first question is, is like kind of like around, uh, like how has Twitter changed the game? Um, and then second is, is uh, more importantly, you know, Blue Sky, right? I don't know if you've heard of Blue Sky, how Jack Dorsey recently announced how he's gonna uh, kind of open source the, uh, the, the, the platform that, that, you know, platforms like Bitcoin are built on, I mean, Twitter is built on top of in the future. And they're looking to, you know, embrace kind of like the blockchain principles, et cetera, et cetera. Have you heard about this? Yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm talking about as well. Like the, the way I've seen Jack talk, talk about it is he talks about Twitter as like one node on a decentralized network for social media or whatever. Like it really just sounds like Mastodon if you've, if you've used that before, where basically, you know, you have this network for, for media, in this case, microblogging, um, like Twitter like posts, and then so everyone can access all the posts on the network, but you also have these nodes on the network where they have they each have their own moderation policies. And moderation is basically curation, or some people call it censorship, but really it's, it's all the same thing. Like they're just trying to curate the information to get rid of spam, like hate speech, like whatever kind of information, like you can even have one where you know you don't allow any altcoin discussion like kind of like our bitcoins moder moderation policy um so yeah this is like a continuation of that trend as well where you have there's value in being in having someone like curate information for you and this is kind of the trend is, it's moving towards with uh twitter as well with uh jack talking about you know twitter will be like one node on a greater network so people might view Twitter as a censored network, but they'll be able to use these alternative uh, platforms on the same greater micro microblogging post network. Um, and, you know, they can choose to opt into whatever, you know, speech terms, if you want to call it that, that uh, these different platforms offer. Interesting. And then, and then I guess your current project, how does that dovetail into this, this kind of storyline or narrative, if you will, like how, how do you, I mean, right now you are the curator. Are you building like an AI version of Kyle or something? <laughs> are you the uh, AI version uh, of Kyle? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you um, answer to? <laughs> um, kind of. I mean, that's what I, when I, I learned like Python and I learned Python just so I could build the the bots that go out and find, you know, the base news for me to look for. And then I sift through that during the day instead of like going to Reddit, Twitter, Bloomberg, Coindesk, Bitcoin Magazine, like all these different sources. I just have the bots go out, find, you know, the bots kind of go out and find the noise for me. And then I find the signal in the noise. Um, but yeah, with this, I mean, like I've been like a freelance writer for the past, uh, you know, eight, seven, eight years or whatever. And now this is kind of like me um, decentralizing myself, I guess, where, you know, I can be the main decider of all the stuff on the website, but I'm going to have, I'm going to like hire other writers and they can kind of like, if I have an idea for an article and I know someone that would be good to, for writing that, I will just outsource it to them and have them write it. Um, not to call like people that are writing for me like bots also, but it's it's kind of like an, I see it all like people that would be writing for me and these bots that go out and find the stories. They're all kind of an extension of myself, um, and so and just so I can be like more uh, impactful this way over time as well. I think if, if I have, you know. I can't do everything all at once, you know. <laughs> mm, 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 yeah. Hey, uh, Kyle, I was going to ask you something um, that just came to my mind. So you, you mentioned that you've been, you'd 
been kind of freelancing with Bitcoin Magazine for almost five years. Were you all, were you there when Vitalik was writing as well? Like, wasn't he also uh, kind of uh, like someone that was writing actively for Bitcoin Magazine? And I guess kind of where I'm going with this, these questions is uh, interested to know your, you know, you talked about MasterCoin, but then, you know, as Ethereum came into light and you, you know, writing for Bitcoin Magazine and kind of seeing the whole, um, you know, the whole industry kind of play out. Just curious uh, how that uh, played into your thinking. And um, yeah, just, just wondering if you had any comments around the, the evolution of Ethereum. Yeah, so with uh, Vitalik specifically, I think he left probably a year or two before I started writing for them. Um, I'm not sure when, I think he kept writing like throughout 2013, but I'd have to go out and check. Um, my view on Ethereum has kind of been the same since before it even launched, which is that, um, you know, as I was saying before, they had like these app coins coming to market around that time. And all the app coins were basically saying, this is a new way to fund open source software. You'll be able to like, you know, invest in these open source soft software projects. And, you know, so if you had, you know, well, we can just use Ethereum as an example. If you buy Ethereum now and it becomes more useful over time, you'll be able to profit. Um, but the problem with all of this was like the economics just didn't really make any sense. Like the, the, all these projects pitch the coin associated with their project as a way to like invest in this open source project, basically. So if it succeeds, they'll, the investors, you know, earn a lot of money. But there, there's really no connection or very limited connection between the, the growth and value of the underlying token and the, the, the growth of the project itself. Um, and so like, and I was, I was very much influenced by the work of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute um, guys around this time where, you know, everyone was still trying to figure out like, all right, there's these new app coins now, there's all these altcoins, like are, are these, you know, do these have any value? What's what's gonna happen with these? Should we, is this something we should pursue? And the app coin people really didn't have any arguments to dispute like, you know, once, once Bitcoin reaches a certain monetary network effects around its uh, use as money, like people are going to prefer to hold that. And if you have to use another token for Ethereum or any other project, they're going to want to hold Ethereum for as little as possible because Bitcoin is the better money. So they'll want to move in and out of the Ether tokens. You know, they don't, they don't want to use those. They want to use Bitcoin. And, and that's kind of how I've seen it. And now, I mean, I have to look at the facts and see that Ethereum is worth a lot more than I ever thought it would be. Um, but my my view generally is still this um, that Ether is basically an app coin that is kind of from a UI perspective uh, a nuisance in some situations. Like you can build everything to work with Bitcoin, um, and a lot of times these alternative tokens are kind of just used as a way to fund development for something else too. So we've, we've seen situations where you know, this new app coin pops up and people invest hundreds of millions of dollars in it. And then those features eventually just find their way into Bitcoin. So like the most obvious example of something like that would be like all these tokens like Litecoin or whatever, focus Bitcoin Cash, all these tokens focused on small payments, micro transactions. And obviously the Bitcoin um, version of that is just the Lightning Network. Um, so yeah, and now I see like Ethereum is kind of like the way I view it now, it's, it's still the same, but another way of, um, describing it is like Ethereum is a Bitcoin side chain. And this seems to be gaining some, uh, some prominence in like, I guess, Bitcoin thought circles where like, now that we have wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum, you can like do anything that you can do with. Ether, you can do it with Bitcoin. And obviously wrapped Bitcoin is like extremely centralized and just the first step. But if you like extrapolate, you know, further out, you can see there would be like a sufficiently trustless version of Bitcoin on Ethereum. 
which is why I, you know, I see Ethereum people like bragging about how much Bitcoin has been issued on Ethereum. But really I see that as like a Trojan horse where Bitcoin is invading their chain and becoming like the preferred version of money on their own chain. And I don't, I don't, I don't think they've, they've thought through the implications of allowing Bitcoin to compete with Ether on their own chain and how that affects the uh, sales pitch for Ether as money as well. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, okay, Kyle, anything else, uh, maybe before we move on to some of the more like contrarian questions or beliefs, anything else on uh, on your kind of your company and uh, anything else you want to share on this topic before we move on? Uh, the, well, the crypto feed is still very much like an experiment that I'm working on. So I don't really know the direction I'm going to take it in the long run. It's just kind of something, I mean, it started out as something I was working on uh, for fun, but now I'm seeing a way of where it could become a, uh, a business. Um, I would like to integrate the Lightning Network into it eventually, um, but the, the, you know it's still early days in, in terms of like developer tools for integrating Lightning into your website, at least in the way um, that I want to do it. Like I want to be able, I want people to be able to like log in with their Lightning node on the website and use that as like their, you know, instead of um, OAuth or whatever, like logging with Google, they can log in with their lightning node and then they, they have a monetary balance attached to that automatically. And I think that opens up um, a lot of opportunities for for new ways in, in doing media. Um, and the, I think the last note I would say on this, just in terms of like the way I'm thinking about it in the future, you know, a lot of people are, thinking of the Lightning Network in terms of like how they can put a piece of content up and have um, someone pay for that with a microtransaction or something. I, th I think the more interesting use cases are going to come from websites paying their visitors, like doing it the other way around um, for doing things like an example for a news website would be like um, if, you, if someone, if a news website posts an article and then there's an error in it, whether it's like a fact, factual error or even just a typo, if you could, you know, make a, if, so, if a reader could make like a pull request on the article and when you approve the pull request for the change to ch fix the typo or whatever, they get like a, a little micropayment for doing so. I think that creates a, um, a better way of doing media, um, but I think, I think a, a reason a lot of places are hesitant to do that is because they don't like to admit when they're wrong to, which is like another problem with traditional media. Um, but that's that's kind of how I'm thinking um, about what I'm going to do with the uh, the crypto feed for now. That is that's super cool. Um... Hey, I got to ask you something. Um, I was going to maybe say this near the end, but I got to ask you, have you heard about uh, GPT-3 and OpenAI? Um, a little bit, but I'm not like too, I don't track the AI stuff like that closely. Um, do you know who Mar, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. I should probably learn it. Marzon. Uh, he's like a OG crypto guy. Um, Anyways, uh, anyways, I'm forgetting his name right now, but there's this, there's this, uh, there's this like OG crypto guy who wrote this like article on his blog about GPT-3 and, uh, and GPT-3 is like this nat, it's like natural language based, uh, like this AI um, project that I think Elon, yeah. Elon, Elon Musk helped found it, but he's no longer part of it or whatever. Um, but anyway, so, so this article, uh, it was something of the nature of like saying how, uh, how this Marzan, whatever this guy, he ran a test where he went on the Bitcoin talk. Um, he used, uh, you know, he used this AI generator to essentially create comments and, you know, and then based on the feedback, it was you know, so it essentially generated comments for Bitcoin talk and ran this experiment and then had this like kind of conclusion statement about like the, the positives and negatives. And then at the end of this entire article, right, this fairly well-written article, you, you, at the end of it, he goes, okay, hold on. He's like, this entire article was not written by me. <laughs> 
He's like, this whole experiment was not designed by me. He's like, this entire um, idea was literally generated by OpenAI. And this entire article was written by OpenAI. And it just like completely like floored me a bit because um, it kind of, you know, like curation is one of the, you know, kind of selling benefits, if you will, like right now of the project that, you know, being able to sift through large amounts of, of information and be able to, so I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that, um, you know, have you seen a lot of, you know, I guess like the, the usage of AI and by, I mean, uh, you know, like, you know, using tools like deep learning and, and, and kind of, you know, you leveraging that to go through all these feeds and streams of data to be able to, you know, kind of tease out the, the most important um, elements. Like, have you, have you, have you gone a bit deeper into this side or is this something that's interesting to you? Um, the only way I've really, you know, I, I don't know like too much about what's on the horizon, but the way social media works now is kind of based on these algorithms that um, I think they gave too much power to the AI before it was ready to do the curation for their platforms. Like if you look on Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, wherever, um, basically the curation for best content is the content that gets the most likes, uh, upvotes, you know, whatever the, the currency of that particular social network right. is. Uh -huh. um, but the, the problem is, is that's proven to be pretty bad, like so far in terms of being able to curate content. Like that's one of the reasons I, I am building the crypto feed is because I think human moderation is still vastly superior to these to AI curation. Um, and you can see this, I think Reddit might be the best example where it's it's obvious that people, marketing companies or whatever, are buying upvotes and, you know, you can manipulate Reddit pretty easily just by buying upvotes and um, pushing your content to the top. Um, and the same applies to like buying Twitter likes or followers or whatever. So I think we're, we, these social media companies um, complain about Trump coming to prominence on their platform through misinformation, but it's it's they built the way that that happens by trusting AI more than humans to curate content. So like when it's so easily manipulated, and there's a huge financial incentive, obviously, for people to do this manipulation, like it's definitely happening. Whether it's on Reddit, Facebook, and then you also have the problem of like obviously. The other issues where like people tend to like like hit the like button on content that is you know more just like a crazy story rather than if it's factual. Um, so I, I mean uh, these systems will definitely improve over time, but I mean right now we're seeing that they're they're pretty bad compared to like a human curator. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, okay, so uh, Kyle, the next, uh, you know, I, I think we're already like started, like I think it was like an hour and 15 minutes. I, it kind of went by really quickly. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, I, I guess it's the famous, you know, Peter Thiel question, right? So which is what is one truth that you hold, uh, which most other, let's say, Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? Um. Let's see. I guess, well, this doesn't really answer the question directly, but it's kind of something I think about um, a lot. And that is, you know, how much decentralization do we really need for Bitcoin to be valuable? Um, you know, you see a lot of altcoins try to find ways to be more decentralized than Bitcoin. So like they say they're ASIC resistant or they use proof of stake, which they say is more decentralized than the ASICs used in Bitcoin to do all that stuff. And then you have like these alternative models with like Ripple, EOS, Stellar, where it is basically just like, it's not really that much different than a permission blockchain because you, 
you're basically choosing the validators to control consensus on the system. So if those are known entities, even if they're dispersed around the world, um, you know, it's it's unclear how censorship resistant that is because obviously, you know, the, the innovation with Bitcoin wasn't necessarily that it was the, the validators were decentralized around the world, it was that they're also potentially anonymous. Like you can mine anonymously, theoretically, which is something that needs to be preserved for the system to be, you know, as censorship resistant as possible. Um, but if you look at something like what happened with BitMEX recently, where, you know, the U.S. government went after them and probably would have frozen, you would, you would have to assume they would have frozen their accounts and everything if they could have. But since they were using Bitcoin and they were only using, I think it was three of four multi-sig for their, for their Bitcoin holdings, so like they they were be able to they were able to be censorship resistant just with a three or four multi sig, and if you compare that to like the whole point of this DeFi thing in Ethereum is supposed to be that you can be more censorship resistant than like centralized exchanges on Bitcoin, but I mean I would joke on Twitter that like well Bitmex got attacked by a government entity and they were able to keep operating pretty much as normal as usual just by using Bitcoin multi sig. So now that makes me think about like um, federated side chains, like are those decentralized enough to operate as like a base platform for things? Um, you mean like you know, how much, yeah, like Liquid or I think RSK says they're not a federated side chain anymore, but I haven't really seen any you know definitive proof of that. It's, I think they're still like, they have like some merge mining thing, but I think at the end of the day, like the federation is still in control. I'm gonna I'm gonna get Diego um, on here soon, but that's another mystery to me is why people don't talk about RSK more and uh, and Liquid and Liquid. These are two platforms that to me seem yeah. like uh, they're ahead of their time. Maybe um, I don't know. Well, I think it's because it's like unclear how much. I think that's the problem. It's like unclear how much decentralization we need. Like, is is Liquid and RSK is that sufficiently decentralized? Because like they have known entities running the the chain basically around like different areas around the world. That's it's very similar to how Ripple works. It, Ripple it, and it, Stellar. It, and it, if you had to pick like uh let's say two axes or maybe three axes upon which you might want to draw like a uh you know like a quadrant type of thing where you're like okay this is like top and right is is like super decentralized what might those axes be uh i don't know like number of nodes or uh you know what i'm saying like uh well in terms of like this in terms of like actual public blockchains, I think the cost of operating a full node is generally thought to be like a metric that you could use to measure decentralization. But there's like so many, obviously that doesn't really apply when, when you're talking about known entities basically doing all the work for you. Um, you know, another interesting thing is like, technically you could have anonymous individuals running a federated Side chain, and that makes it obviously a lot more resistant to government attacks. But then you also open up the possibility, like all these anonymous individuals running the side chain could be the same person. So it's like there's a lot of different trade-offs that are being explored, and I mean they're they are being explored in altcoins, but they're also being explored in Bitcoin itself, where you have like Lightning, you have you know Pulse Sports drive chains, you have federated side chains, you have uh, state chains, you have, you know, or not, uh, I'm forgetting the name of uh, Ruben Sampson's, uh, it's like a federated side chain alternative, but I mean, we're seeing, we're gonna see a lot of experimentation in this area. Um, and it, well, the other important thing to note here is like, this is something, what, when talking about Ethereum specifically, it's like, one of the main criticisms before it even launched was that, well, you can pretty much do all of this with Bitcoin multi-sig because you still have the Oracle problem, which Ethereum doesn't solve. So like, even though on Bitcoin, um, you could have like a two of three multi-sig contract where um, it's like a bet on, NBA, on the NBA finals or something. And 
if the Lakers win, you know, this address gets the money. If the um, Miami Heat win, then this address gets the money. And the third signer is obviously the Oracle in that prop in that situation. Like Ethereum doesn't really solve that issue. Um, so like a lot of the DeFi stuff is kind of smoke and mirrors in a way. Like you could use DAI as an example where it's promoted as this like completely decentralized stable coin that can't be corrupted or whatever. The reality is they still use a federation of oracles to decide what the correct price for the token is. And now it's gotten like even worse where they're backing the DAI with uh, centralized stable coins. So like if Ethereum doesn't solve the Oracle problem, then like what they've basically just been LARPing for the past, you know, however many years. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, a lot of questions, but I'm gonna <laughs> try and keep it tight here. Um, okay, so, so, okay, okay. So if I were to, like, so if you were to sum up that in terms of like uh, your, your contrarian belief, it would be what then in like a sentence or two on the Bitcoin side of things? Um, I, well, I guess it's two contrarian takes really. Mm. It's that we don't need um, full decentralization all the time. I guess that could be a, a uh, contrarian take as a Bitcoiner. And then the other contrarian take is like, you do need decentralization, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes. So if you're, if you're building, you know, some, some people would say that Ethereum or Ripple are making trade-offs in terms of decentralization. Um, and like they're getting efficiency, efficiency gains for um, being a bit more centralized. But the problem is like, you can do that in Bitcoin too. You just keep the base layer decentralized and then you build the more centralized layers on top of it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, so like the, so like finding the trade-offs between, uh, you know, yeah, uh, interesting. Another another really cool thing or interesting thing is a little bit rewinding a bit, but you were talking about the difference between censorship and curation. And uh, do you just do you do you want to just maybe comment on like what the difference is there because that was really at the heart of the whole Bitcoin Cash movement, and it was like, oh, we're being censored. But I, I don't get how, like, to me, censorship is like more when there's like maybe force being applied, or you're like forced to something. But but you know, if it's a private platform, but I'm just curious on your thoughts on that one, uh, Kyle. Like, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, I think the problem is it's hard to tell because one man's censorship is another man's curation or moderation. Um, in terms of like the R Bitcoin stuff specifically, I think they were dealing, they say they were dealing with a lot of like vote manipulation. Um, so the way to deal with that was just to like start like banning people left and right. Um, and now we're seeing like Twitter come in and like start putting, adding context, um, they, they say to, uh, to tweets. Um, you know, as long as it's not at the government level, it's hard to argue that it's censorship, but I still see, you know, like Twitter is such an influential platform that obviously what they, the, the way they handle their platform, if they had start adding context to stuff and everything, um, that it starts to look a bit like censorship. Um, you know, it's, I think what we're going to see either way is like, I've been saying the curators are going to become the new, you know, deciders of, of information basically. And people are going to have to opt into the systems that they choose and, uh, see as fair and balanced. Um, yeah, I don't, it, it's a very, it's a hard thing to like narrow down. Cause like in different situations, you have different circumstances. Um, you know, with the, the our Bitcoin stuff, I, I probably would have had a problem with it if it was like Reddit doing the enforcement of changes in content policy rather than the moderators themselves. Cause even, even on like Reddit, you can opt into a different subreddit. Um, and obviously there are like yeah, network so effects around the base, the, the platform that's being used right now. Um, and like, 
once you once the network effects are so powerful, you, like you basically are kind of like a government um, entity in some ways. Interesting. So it's like a function of, I guess, how much power you have and how much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. OK, so um, so the same question I asked prior, uh, but as it pertains to the world, uh, I, I know we talked about media at large. Um, so there might have been something buried in there already, but just curious, any any other any other kind of like uh, you know, truths that you hold that you think others, not necessarily in the Bitcoin world, but in the world might disagree with you on? Um, mm -hmm. um, well, just something I've been thinking about more recently is I've been trying to, you know, think about like why um, there is so much chaos in the world right now, or at least in the, you know, the U.S. political system. If you look at this technological revolution that we're having in, in content, basically, we had all these old institutions um, that were controlling the narrative, and now we have new institutions emerging that have their own uh, points of view. Um, and during this, we're seeing like a, we're in the middle of like a transition from old media to new media. And there's a lot, it's not like a, it's not like a two-step process where like, oh, these, this media was bad. Now this media is good. Let's move on. It's this confusing time period in between where people don't know who to trust. Um, has caused a lot of chaos where we have like, that's how, that's basically what Trump kind of thrived on was he was able to thrive because old media was, there are problems with old media and they refused to address them. So when Trump says media bad, people are like, yeah, they are. And, but the problem is that doesn't mean Trump is like our new political institution that everyone's going to follow. I think we're still in the development uh, stages where these new media institutions are being built on the internet. And I'm sure many of the old institutions are gonna adapt and you know, still, still be relevant and everything. But like, if you look at it now, I think the next presidential, the next president, presidential candidate that comes to prominence will probably come to prominence through like Joe Rogan's podcast, not being on CNN. Um, and so we're still seeing the development of like which, which of these new media sources are going to become the new institutions. Um, so like someone like Alex Jones and in Infowars, I just use him as an example because it's an easy example where people generally agree that you know it's not the the most well well fat checked information on his website. Um, you know he's able to come to prominence because of those failures of the old system, but now we're seeing like. I guess the example on the right would be someone like Ben Shapiro, who people view as a lot more practical than like an Alex Jones type. And now Ben Shapiro is a lot more influential than Alex Jones. Um, and I think we're gonna see more of that play out um, as we continue. I don't know I don't know if I was really going to a point there, or just kind of- I was, I, was, I, was I was picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I guess like on a, on a final note, anything that you wish I had maybe asked, uh, you know, that maybe I, I didn't? Um, yeah, anything else you want to share? Um, you, well, you did mention uh, UBI a little mm. bit, or I think it's, I guess that was before we... Started yeah, yeah. Before we, yeah, that's one of the that's one of the the tangents I like to go on a bit. I mean, if you're uh, if you've got any thoughts on it, would love to hear. Well, the only I've been thinking about it more recently, and the only, you know, I'm not I'm not sure where. I mean, I would definitely see it as a, a better option than like current welfare systems. And I think about it in my own life, the reason I was able to do what I do now is because I had um, a support system of my family to just kind of, you know, do just try to figure out what I want to do for like a year instead of, you know, getting a job right away. Um, and that's basically the same thing as UBI where you give people money to, so they don't have to worry about, um, you know, uh, rent, uh, food, like all the, all the problems that come from not having enough money. Um, but I, 
So I guess the point I'm getting to is like, I think that's going to be tied to central bank digital currencies at some point. Like that seems like the trend we're going towards. And uh, the, I see like a dystopian vision where that eventually leads to a clash, like the final clash between Bitcoiners and, you know, I don't know even what you would call the other side, like traditional government followers. Um, and if if all these people are getting UBI through these central bank digital currencies, like that gives them a huge incentive to go along with something like a ban on Bitcoin, um, because you're basically taking away their their ability to survive by taking away the UBI that is, that is attached to the central bank digital currency. Um, so I mean, we could see like an eventual clash between UBI and central bank digital currencies, and then free markets in Bitcoin, basically. Um, and I think we are seeing like a, a paradigm shift in like what left versus right means. Like I, Peter Thiel said this in an interview a few years ago, where it's more like it's about, you know, big data versus Bitcoin and everyone, you know, taking care of their own data. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think about like this idea that UBI could be attached to a central bank digital currency, and then it's, it causes this clash of, between like government advocates and Bitcoiners. Because um, like like if you're receiving UBI through that monetary system, you might have an incentive to very much support a, a ban on Bitcoin um, if it's demonized as like a way to get around um, these um, collectivist centralized policies. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah. So what do I think? So first of all, I think we had a bit of a glimpse into what that might look like given, you know, COVID, right? So I know in Canada, people got something called a CERB, which was essentially, you know, like a, a, I guess like kind of like in Ubi, but not, it wasn't for everyone. It was for people who had kind of were able to prove that they were, had an income, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I think you saw maybe some, something like that in the United States. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the interesting meme around that was, you know, people saying how you should buy Bitcoin with your CERB or whatever, your handout. Um, yeah. And then there's even like all these indexes and these meters, like if you had put your $1,200 into Bitcoin, it would be worth like 2,500 today or whatever, whatever. Um, so, so I definitely, I, I don't know if I, I mean, I can, okay, wait, sorry. So I should definitely say yes, there, there could be a clash because um, again, we could touch this on, touch on this in a different, uh, on a different podcast if you want, or in a, in a conversation, but you know, in India, we had a, a very interesting situation, uh, you know, happen with the central bank, right? Where they didn't essentially want banks working with, uh, you know, Bitcoin companies like, like the one I helped found back in 2013. And, and so, so I do think that there's, there's a bit of animosity there. I don't think it needs to exist. Um, you know, I think central banks, I think forward thinking central banks may choose to hold Bitcoin in their reserves, just like countries used to hold gold. Um, you might have heard of the Bretton Woods, you know, the revisiting of the Bretton Woods agreement. Um, you know, will it, is that an opportunity or like potentially like the biggest threat ever, uh, TBD? Yeah, um, well, that, was, that was like the meme around the Iran stuff too. Like, is this the most bullish or most bearish Bitcoin news of all time. Yeah, a lot of, lot of interesting things playing out. You know, um, I was uh, I was invited to the, have you ever heard of the OECD? Yes. So I was invited to their uh, blockchain summit last year. And so I got a front row seat with, uh, you know, a room with 2,500 central bankers talking about CBDCs. And I remember in that in that meeting, they literally had someone from Facebook come in and pitch Libra. And he was like, you know, kind of the focus of that that entire three days. Um, it was insane, like watching him kind of, you know, take a lot of the punches because Satoshi dipped. So there's no 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 one for, for to, <laughs> to, to, to have to do that. Um, and I would say one of my uh, kind of like takeaways was do you know Yanni 
Yanni from eToro. He's like the founder of eToro. I feel like yeah. I talk like I talk about him on every show. But Yanni, he's also the founder of Colored Coins, by the way. His name is on the, if I'm not mistaken, on the white yeah. paper for he's a he's a really smart guy. And so he pitched at this OECD meeting this something called the good dollar, which is essentially a like a pri not a government based, but like a private market ubi solution that is built on top of ethereum you know i think you could probably build it on rsk as well but but you know he chose to build it on ethereum and what they do is they take the profits generated from you know these i guess DeFi platforms like the the automation and the robo advisory and whatever the hell these these wi-fi and these guys are doing so let's say let's say you know you're you have a bunch of bitcoin you can actually I guess, kind of stake them in the system. And then based on the automation and the profits that are generated, they essentially feed that back into the Ubi um, kind of network. And, and you can literally go on there today and, and kind of claim your, your, your good dollars, if you will. Um, so I, I bring it up not because I think it's like the end game, but I think there's something there. I, I, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like Instead of that clash happening, I feel like you could probably take some of the principles of open source, decentralization, Bitcoin, blockchain, and maybe, just maybe, like, like the thing that worries me about AI is, is that all the data, right? You said it's a competition between data and Bitcoin. All the data resides, uh, you know, in, in five, what, six maybe companies, walls, and maybe two governments, right? So, so this beast, this AI, this thing that's coming our way, its source of truth, if you will, are like six nodes <laughs> or seven nodes. Um, yeah. Wouldn't it be much better if we could build uh, whatever this, 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 and when I, say, when I refer to this thing, I'm talking about like the singularity at large, you know, not like narrow bands of AI, yeah. like my Tesla or like Google or whatever, but like something that's like, you know, perhaps a bit towards sentient and, you know, whatever, something that's super smart and can kind of like do a lot of the things that humans do today. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I do think, I, do, I think about, I think, so, so I guess what I'm getting at is, is that I sometimes have like visions, if you will, of like a renaissance, right? Like where, where like people are like, oh my God, we can rebuild all of this from scratch, from like princ first principles where, like I said, it's all open source, it's all decentralized. And perhaps, maybe not all of the profits, but perhaps some of the profits generated from robotics and automation is somehow fed back into like an UV system. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I think, because inevitably the question comes down to where does the money come from? And, and if it's coming yeah. from other people in the form of inflation and taxation, I'm not a very big fan of that as a Bitcoiner. But if it could somehow, again, systematically somehow come from, and again, even this, even saying it makes me feel like, you know, uh, like I'm socialist or communist to some extent, but, um, but I don't know, maybe not. Maybe it doesn't have to do with some sort of ism. It's maybe it's something about, like I said, maybe it's about designing a system that addresses these systemic issues, right? Like there should be no way that like billions of people on earth literally have nothing, like have, they're born into nothing, they die into nothing. Um, and to just rely on super wealthy people and governments seems, I don't know, a bit, like op, like I don't know, overly optimistic, if you will, and so so I wonder. I sometimes wonder if you know if if there might be a, a better solution out there. Yeah, I, like obviously the best case scenario is like everyone comes together and opts into UBI for everyone from a private source, like you said. But, but like you said, the, it's hard to create the incentives for that sort of system to just like appear out of nowhere. Um, I guess we can maybe just leave this as like a final note, like extrapolating that dystopian, you know, clash between Bitcoin and central bank digital currencies over time. Like maybe in that situation, Bitcoiners start their own version of UBI just because they need more support for their system that they're promoting um, in terms of like more individualism instead of um, uh, collectivism. So maybe to convince these people that are tied to the central bank digital currencies, UBI, they start giving the money to people too. <laughs> and they, cause they need to, you know, defend um, their citadels, uh, whatever, whatever end up, ends up happening. Um, I've got a name for this program, Bitcoin faucets. We're bringing it back, baby. 
Poor uh, poor Gavin getting billions of dollars. (laughs) I I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions, Kyle. I mean, this is precisely why I'm doing this. uh, This. this this whatever the hell this is you know is is just because i feel like there's all these like you know pink elephants and everybody's just kind of looking to like people who are you know in their late 90s to solve them and uh, you know it's a very chaotic time and we're all trying to figure out how this new technology just the internet is a massively changing the world and it's okay to just say that you don't know what's going to happen, and but, but you're you're here for the the ride to watch and see because it's very exciting. Yeah, and I and I don't ever claim to be like, well, I've got the answer, but I do believe right. that the answer is out there and it's in the brains of people, right? And 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 the I've I've always believed that like I do my best thinking when I'm around people, right? Like I love meditating and all that kind of stuff. But at one point, you know, rubber's got to meet, they got to meet the road and you've got to be able to connect the dots and and kind of throw, anyway, so I'm a big fan of this. So Kyle, with that said, um, I was going to ask you to share maybe, I don't know where you want people to, you know, learn more about you, your, your, you know, Twitter handle, your website, that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, then we can bring it to a close. If you want to do a follow-up, like I said, next week, next month, next year, whenever, uh, I'm game. <laughs> we could we could do that. Yeah, so I, I, guess, I think most people follow me on Twitter. I'm just, just at Kyle Torpey, T-O-R-P-E-Y. And then and if you want to track on what I'm working on with the crypto feed, it's at the cryptofeed.net. And there's a Twitter account and everything, too. And I think most people find value in the newsletter at this point, where it's just all the t- all the news that I see as valuable throughout the day uh, is sent out um, every Monday through Friday, and then there's a weekend version on Sundays too. Um, but yeah, and if, if you want to, I have a Telegram for the crypto feed too. If you want to um, yeah, join sure. that and kind of talk about these ideas more. Um, Anyone can check that out. And the link to that is on the, uh, the cryptofeed.net too. Awesome, Kyle. Well, you know, in, I guess in closing, I just wanted to say, I, I have a lot of respect for you for the work you've done in this space. You know, I know whenever we've had times that were tough, but you know, where we needed to maybe get something out um, in terms of like real information signal, you know, you were one of the few people that we we would turn to. And so, yeah, I think, I don't know. I just, uh, like I said, I, I think we need more people like you out there who are going out there and putting in the effort to really make sure that, you know, they're, they're doing their best to, to get, to get, to get our perspective or like the Bitcoin's perspective, Satoshi's perspective out there a bit. Cause that, that side is oftentimes uh, overlooked. Well, I would recommend everyone should be a content creator too. Like the way the world works now is you're not really having a voice unless you're um, creating content on the internet. And it's a lot easier than you probably think it is. Like I said, I was just reading about Bitcoin on Bitcoin talk uh, for a long time before there was much media and I just started writing about it and people found it interesting. So I definitely recommend anyone ever, anyone and everyone to be, uh, try creating, whether it's like YouTube videos or articles or podcasts, like everyone um, should be doing that. And that's not a guarantee that you're going to succeed, but you know, I've found that it's um, not that difficult. Yeah, man. And, and, you know, uh, I recently started focusing a bit of attention on sunnyray.com and it's, kind of empowering because I realized recently I'm like there's one thing that's never going away or at least while I'm on planet earth that's my name and so it's nice to you know sometimes just uh yeah yeah <laughs> focus yeah, a bit on, on building your own people, brand yeah more people are like doing like a, whatever their first name last is dot com just says like a way you know everything doesn't have to be on twitter facebook and you know whatever we, we need to have our own um, platforms basically and it's kind of nice to see because it's kind of the way the internet was originally imagined to be where everyone has their own website and you know you share information that way rather than you know just go on Facebook and see whatever content they're throwing at. Kyle, you said 
Kai, you said you have a newsletter too, right? I mean, that is becoming like a mega trend now. Um, are you using Substack? Is that like, a, what's, yeah, just sorry. I, I keep saying last question, but I'm just yeah. sort of curious about that. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I looked at it a little bit. Um, you know, it, I mean, I, I recently subscribed to like uh, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald when he left the Intercept and he was through uh, Substack. So I'm, I'm definitely like aware of what it is. Um, in terms, yeah, I mean, I'm not using that right now. I'm just using like a MailChimp kind of thing. Um, but I mean, maybe eventually I do move to that. It, it kind of gets into like how you want to like be able to monetize everything. Like, is it going to be a subscriber thing? Is it going to be ads still? I mean, that could be like a whole nother um, podcast episode. Yeah. Cool, Kyle. Well, let's let's maybe bring it to an end there. Uh, thanks again for everything, and yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. Awesome.